Hey folks, happy to have you here. Happy I was able to watch the game tonight and happy that it ended a way I really liked. Um, once again, rocking a hat again uh, because my hair is out of control. Unlike the game for the Oilers tonight, uh, I, I don't really want to like brush my hair when it's like midnight and I'm going to record for 15 minutes. Maybe I could, but the hat works, I think. I like the hat. I'm not sponsored by Browning or anything. I'd like to be, but I don't, I don't know why they sponsor me. Even if my channel was big, because I'm talky. But uh, anyways, let's get right into the game. Uh, the Obviously, there's a playoff atmosphere between the Kings and the Oilers. Uh, that's been the case in the last two games. Uh, Oilers won the first meeting, and then LA, won, I believe, won the second meeting. And uh, it's always been very much playoff atmosphere. As I said, one thing in the news for the Kings has been their structure. They've been 1-3-1. Uh, Zadarov has criticized it. Drysaddle has poked fun at how disappointing it is and, to play against, and a lot of fans don't really appreciate it. But Dowdy defended it, and uh, more importantly, I think their coach Hiller said it best. Is uh, I'm paraphrasing. I I did, don't have his exact quote up, but it's like it's whatever makes you win, right? And I I totally agree. So. My opinion on one three and one is like, if you have to resort to one three and one, I think that means uh, your players aren't playing hockey as well as the other guys. But it doesn't matter as long as you're winning. Who I it, it doesn't matter if your guys are better or not. At the end of the day, it matters did you win? The Kings didn't, but they had been winning uh, partly in part to the one three and one. You saw its effectiveness tonight, uh, but I think you also saw Chris Knobloch's effectiveness as a coach tonight, and I think it was on display as. Uh, the discussion of the Oilers, they didn't dismantle the Kings 1-3-1, and one, but they were able to work around it. Uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with physicality. i got to clean my glasses mid-recording. mid, mid uh, recording. Uh, I can still talk without having glasses. Just blurry vision. Um, I could make a joke about how it was blurry for Talbot, but I thought he was fine. I don't think the three goals against him were like super bad or anything. It's just you don't want to go 16 for 19 as a goalie. You don't you don't want to let any goals in. But anyways, um, so I think the Oilers' physicality helped in the modern NHL where you, the two line pass rule isn't there and everybody's really fast and tough. Hitting the value of hitting has has dropped. Um, but I do credit the Oilers' increased physicality with helping them in the playoffs against the Kings in both the last two years. Uh, I think the Oilers' ability to bully the Kings helped them win. Uh, it wasn't the reason the Oilers beat the Kings in either of those two series, but I think it helped quite a bit. Uh, there's lots of things that it's helped with, and tonight I think it helped, one, get under the Kings' skin, which obviously happened not as much as usual. Both teams were actually quite disciplined tonight, uh, despite the usual intensity. Um... But it also allowed them to win puck battles. So one of the lines was McLeod, Kane, and Perry. <laughs> I, I really liked that that line against the Kings. I think generally I don't, I wouldn't put those three together. But uh, I liked it against the Kings because uh, the line was still able to be offensively dangerous with McLeod, and with Perry and Kane on the wings, they were able to cause a lot of trouble and headaches for the Kings. Uh, it feels nice to be on the bullying side. The Oilers haven't been there in a long time, and uh, they've started showing it last year. And I've, it's been they've been one of, more, one of the more physical teams this year. And so I think, well, I mean, with the one three and one formation the Kings employ, it forces teams to dump it, and uh, the Oilers are able to do that because uh, we're and are able to work with that because even though they're much more dangerous on the rush rather than a dump, most teams are, but especially the Oilers. Uh, their guys are still pretty tough. McDavid is still a pretty tough guy. He's not small by any means. Drysaddle uh, has a sturdy body as well. And back to Kane and Perry, those guys are going to win puck battles along the boards. Uh, they don't create too much offense out of that, but I, I thought it was good and that they were able to keep the puck in L.A. zone. Even if they couldn't get a shot off, they were able to keep it there because L.A. couldn't win puck battles with Kane and Perry all the time. So... I think that was 
good. And uh, Louis DeBrusque at the end of the game also pointed out the uh, Oilers passing having changed uh, for the Kings, where they used the outside a lot more than usual, uh, which was good. So I thought it was a really efficient game from both teams, but uh, one team was more efficient. But let's get right into it, go over what happened, the important stuff. Uh, so we're at home. One of the refs is, ha is having his 1,000th game. I forget his name. I think it was Kyle Remen from Red Deer. Congratulations to him. And it's Corey Perry's 1,300th game, maybe 1,200th. I'm pretty sure 1,300th. Big congrats to him too. Um, anyways, they're... It gets physical early because they always want to set a tone. Uh, they know they can. They've had success with being physical against the Kings in the past, and they want to do it again. And they do it again tonight. And it begins with Kane laying a big hit on Doughty uh, behind the net, uh, but it's called for a penalty. And looking at it, I was kind of like, "What? That was a clean hit. Oh, okay. Well, it was a little late. Doughty had already passed the puck. Uh, okay, interference. That that's a fair penalty. Tripping." Tripping, what? Kane's stick wasn't even part of it. I, um, I know sometimes a tripping call will be made if um, a guy trips another player with their foot. I don't think that happened. Maybe you could argue it did. I don't think so. So I wasn't complaining too much because a penalty could have been called. But I was very, very much questioning it being called tripping. Interference, sure. Tripping? I don't know. Anyways, uh, of course, it's on Oilers fans' minds the state of refing because I, I think it's a lot better than Oilers fans will admit. But you know the Winnipeg, how the Winnipeg game almost ended, and how the Ottawa game went, refing is the quality of refing is certainly on the Oilers' minds. So that wasn't really a great start in Oilers' minds, but it worked out. I thought refing was fine and all that. Uh, the Oilers are able to kill that penalty, and then there's a couple penalties. At the five, just a second before the five minute mark, uh, Lizot go, hooks Dry Saddle, and there's a penalty. And then when Lizot turns around and puts his back to Dry Saddle and complains to the ref, <laughs> Dry Saddle takes a stick and whacks Lizot in the back of the shin. And I, you know, I should be mad at Dry for wasting this power play opportunity, but like, I was also laughing because. I know how pissy Dry Saddle can get with his stick, and so I was just I was more entertained by it than mad, and uh, I was also all the madness was put away because the Oilers do score on that four on four, making it a one nothing game. It's Connor McDavid, of course, with his twenty seventh goal of the year and his hundred twentieth point, his third straight consecutive season. I guess that's what straight and consecutive mean. I didn't need to say I didn't need to say both words, but third consecutive season with hundred twenty points. Not a long list of players who've done that. And he's assisted by uh, Bouchard and Ekholm. And then the 4-on-4 uh, four four eventually dies off. And there's a lot of uh, back and forth. It's a pretty um, efficient game. Both teams are playing quite well defensively in the first. Uh, Edmonton gets a power play opportunity at the 14 and 11 second mark when Laferriere goes off for slashing. But the league best LA penalty kill proves why they're league best holding the or their second league best power play to only one shot uh, really stuffs that or this power play and then the period ends with uh, shots 8 to 7 favorite Edmonton that extra shot being a goal and um, well not the last shot of the Oilers I just mean both goalies had 7 saves but one goalie allowed one second period uh, it was another tight affair and there was not a lot of whistles for the second period. It went by pretty fast. Um, there wasn't any penalties. And both teams were kind of going back and forth. Lots of physicality. The orders mounted a lot of hits in the first and second period. Uh, they were already at like 40 by the end of the second period. Uh, I think, no, I don't think they were at 40 by the second period. I'm trying to remember. Because they ended with just under 50, which is a lot. And we'll get to that. But they, I remember looking at their hit numbers in the second period and like... Wow, this is more more hits they've had in this game than so far than they have in most games, and Oilers hit quite a bit. Um, but anyways, the period looks like it's going to be rather uneventful until 16 seconds out. Drysaddle has the puck behind the net. He burger flips or backhand. It's we call it a burger flip for Drysaddle because it's such a massive paddle he's got going on. But he he 
throws the puck, and I don't know if he meant to do this, but it going in, it doesn't, it's not on net, it's going towards Adam Henrik, and Henrik, it's going right towards his chest. I'm not sure Henrik really knew what to do with that, but it didn't matter because I think it was Lazat or Sun King's defenseman, uh, pushes him in the back, and he pushes Henrik in just the right way, that when the puck comes to Henrik's chest, it deflects into the net. <laughs> Again, it, as we said with Hyman, doesn't matter how, matters how many. And that is Henrik's 21st goal of the year, his third with the Oilers. And I don't think it's a way any coach draws it up, using your own player as a backboard uh, to score a goal. But that's what happened, and the Oilers take a 2-0 lead, scoring uh, with just one or just 16 seconds left in the second period. So that's got to be quite a downer for the Kings to have held the order scoreless the entire period, only for to have to go to locker room, having allowed a really weird goal that's hard to defend because it's not like Drysdale and Henrik practice this. It's not like Drysdale tells Henrik to stand in front of the net and say, okay, I'm going to shoot pucks off of you. I don't think anybody's willing to do that with like without a juggernaut suit or something. But, uh... Again, it's a goal. 2-0. Oilers heading into the third. 2-0 lead, even though the Oilers are feeling a little confident because, hey, we've we've managed the Kings very well. we got a 2-0 lead. Uh, it's, you know, 2-0 lead isn't a big lead in hockey. Neither is 3-0, uh, which the Oilers will eventually get to. But first, there's a interference call on Zach Hyman, 1 minute and 31 seconds into the third period. Uh, but the Oilers do kill that penalty. And then... Uh, the LA Kings find themselves shorthanded when Matt Roy or Wa, I don't know, uh, gets a slashing penalty at 4 minutes and 42 seconds into the third period. And 23 seconds into that power play, Evan Bouchard cracks the awesome penalty kill of the Kings for his 16th goal of the year, and he's assisted by the pick, the big two, not the pig two, the big two, Drysaddle and McDavid. It's a 3 nothing lead. And... Um, after that, the Oilers are kind of in, well, we're not going to try super hard to score, but just, you know, have the puck and not not let the other team score too much. You know, keep skating is what's important. But by the 10-minute mark of the third period, the Kings really take over. And part of it is because, well, the Oilers don't really need to go score goals. They just can't allow the Kings to score three. Um, and... That doesn't excuse the Oilers allowing the Kings to get a ton of shots in the last 10. Uh, but Skinner is nearly perfect during this. But he does allow a goal uh, to Arthur Kaliev. It was a weird play where Ekholm had the puck behind the net. And he's usually very careful, very efficient. You don't expect any scripts from him, whether he's with the puck or without it or whatnot. But he kind of muffs on the pass. And so the puck bounces to... Uh, or clear, I don't know if it was a pass or clear, but it, he miffs it, muffs it, whatever you want to say, and the puck ends up in Kaliev's stick in the slot, and he snipes it for his seventh goal of the year at the 13 minute 47 second mark, and it's assisted by Quinton Byfield. So I was wrong, the bouncing puck went to Byfield first, who then passed it to Kaliev, who was in the slot. Um, and now it's a 3 1 lead for the Oilers instead of the 3 0. So, uh, the the Shout out chance for Skinner is gone. I think that would have been pretty demoralizing for the Kings to get shut out by a team you really hate and may very well see in the playoffs still, though there was a standings change as a result of tonight. We'll get to that. Uh, but the Kings still lay it on. They get a lot of pressure, and Skinner holds strong. He has a very excellent last 10 minutes. I don't like that he had to have such an excellent last 10 minutes, but I like that he did. Um, CC does manage to shoot the puck from his own end to the empty net with 41 seconds left in the third period. It's his third goal of the year, and he's assisted by Leon Dreisaitl. And the game ends 4-1 in favor of the Oilers. Shots in the third period were a monster 15-5 in favor of the Kings. The final shots of the of the game was 33-20 to uh, for the Kings. I think that doesn't tell a great story because it's not like the Kings dominated for all... 60 minutes, not like they were out shooting the Oilers all the time. Uh, both teams were kind of exchanging leads and shots, and there wasn't any major leads and shots until the last 10 minutes when the Kings were able to pour it on. Um, and and, and might have worked out. 
Uh, I mentioned hits were quite heavy. The Kings did get 32, which is a re very respectable high number, but the Oilers ended with 49 hits on the game. And even though we can, we can always talk about how important is hitting, but 49 is a lot. It wears down the other team and will get under their skin. Uh, it forces them to screw up and, and stuff, as long as you're smart with your hits. And uh, the Kings did manage to be quite disciplined, as well as the Oilers. It's easy for lots of penalties to happen when a team has nearly 50 hits, uh, whether you're not being too careful where you're, when you're hitting or the other guy gets pissed and takes a penalty himself. But credit to both teams for being disciplined, uh, despite the stakes and the intensity of surrounding the game. Uh, the Kings did have the Oilers number in the faceoff circle. Uh, Dry Soto wasn't too great in the faceoff circle as well, below 50% uh, for the first time in a while, allowing the Kings to uh, have a 57.3% win rate in the faceoff circle. It's the first time in a while the Oilers uh, lost the faceoff battle in the game, but I'm not going to complain too much because the Oilers won. Uh, it also helps that the Kings do have Kopitar and Denal, who are incredible faceoff takers. I don't know Dubois' number, but I know teams like him and overpay him. Anyways, uh, special teams, the Oilers did manage to score one on their two power plays uh, and were perfect on the penalty kill. Both teams only had two chances. Skinner was excellent, 32 for 33. Not really going to blame that goal on him. He could have maybe been better, but I'm not like going to be super hard on him because he would have had to make a fantastic save. Um, Talbot was 16 for 19, which is an ugly stat line, but I think on all three of the goals, he would have had to make a really incredible save to save those. Uh, they just, you know, the Kings defense did a lot for him, uh, but when they screwed up, they kind of screwed up big time. Uh, except the Bouchard goal, that was more of just an incredible snipe by Bouchard than anything. Um, maybe they could have done more on the Henrique goal, but that was weird. It was, again, it was using his chest as a backboard. Um, and the McDavid goal was just a McDavid-esque goal. So it's kind of hard to blame Talbot, even despite the the uh, ugly stat line of 16 for 19 for Talbot. Uh, or there's three stars. The first star I chose was Connor McDavid. And I, I'm actually, for the first time in a while, my three stars is the exact same as sports nets. Or, or the Oilers who choose them, because usually they'll throw in a guy who had a milestone or something, but but they didn't, because they're, the only milestones were games played for the ref and Perry, um, but I and McDavid hitting 120 points again. But he was my first star. He had a goal, two assists, a shot on goal, five hits, a block, and two, 21 and a half minutes of ice time. Skinner was the second star. He was, th again, 32 for 33, uh, made a lot of excellent big saves at the end. He didn't have too many dangerous saves, until those last 10 minutes when he had to put up with a lot. And finally, Leon Dreisel was the third star. He had three assists, two shots on goal, two hits, and seven seconds off of 20 minutes of ice time. Uh, there were some other notable plays. Bouchard had a goal and assist and stuff, but I, I wanted to highlight uh, the hitting. When you have 49 hits, you're going to have a lot of heavy hitters. Uh, Nurse led the way with seven hits. Henrique had six hits, as well as Evander Kane. Hyman had five, and McDavid also previously mentioned had five. He's been hitting a lot more, as I mentioned in a short. Janmark had four, and Hyman had... Wait a minute, I have Hyman down here twice, so who did I mean to have three? Because I noted everybody who had three hits, and now i got to pull up my app again. But while I'm pulling it up, I will, I will also say that Brown uh, and DeHarnay were the only guys who were not credited with a hit. Usually when there's lots of hitting, it's because of DeHarnay, but uh, he didn't have any credited... Okay, so it was Hyman had three, and it was Nugent Hopkins who had five hits. He is not a known hitter, but he, he played the body tonight and played well. Uh, I think even though when you're outshot, uh, what was it, 33 to 20, that's usually a sign that the Oilers didn't play coach's game. But I think they did, actually. I think it was very efficient. I think the whole plan was, you know, you look at the Kings' ability to protect leads. So they're very good at protecting leads. Once it comes to the standings, haha! -ha! But uh, Kings fans are welcome to the channel. Hope you feel welcome and happy to have you here. Um, you can make jokes about the Oilers. You're certainly welcome too. But uh, anyways, the Kings are very good at protecting leads, and uh, so I think the plan for the Oilers was to, you know, contain the Kings' offense and then capitalize on what few 
high danger chances they'll give you, which is a lot to ask for, but the Oilers are capable of it and did do it tonight. And then just kind of hold that lead and, and sit on it. And, and they didn't really sit on it because if you, it's like football, prevent defense prevents wins. And the Oilers didn't really do prevent defense until those last 10 minutes. Uh, but fortunately, Skinner was just incredible in those last 10. Um, so again, I don't think anybody really had a particularly bad night or ugly night. I saw a lot of good from a lot of uh, Oilers players. The only notable mistake I can mention is Mateus Ekholm. But uh, when it happened, I, w I was kind of like, oh, dang, Ekholm, don't... It sucks to see you make a mistake. But then I realized, I'm glad it was Ekholm because if it was someone else, they'd get torched by the fan base. I mean, if Nurse did it, Nurse had a great game, but nobody would care if he had that mistake. Nurse could have three assists and be our best defensive player but if he messed up the way Ekholm did he would have got torched for the fan base so I'm like I'm actually happy Ekholm did it because we know it's hopefully it's not going to be an issue for him he still had an assist so uh, I also wanted to mention Skinner's puck handling it doesn't get mentioned enough uh, he doesn't have the stretch pass ability that Mike Smith had but he's very calm and calculated and he's very good with it I, I've seen it before where he'll have the puck behind the net and a guy behind him will stick lift him but he's very strong and heavy on the stick, so it didn't work, and he was able to get the pass off. And tonight he had the puck behind the net, and he was flanked by a Kings player on either side, and he was still managed to get the puck, the puck to an Oilers player. Just like that. So he's, he's very accurate with his passes. He doesn't have the same long-range accuracy, or at least we haven't seen it yet, but he, he's very good with the puck. And he has scored a goal as a goalie before. That came when he was playing uh, in the juniors for the Lethbridge Hurricanes in... Uh, and I think that's AJHL. I don't know. Uh, might be WHL. I don't know. It's a junior league. Anyways, uh, that's it for tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm going to mention the standings uh, mix-up because obviously it was on a lot of people's minds that the Warriors and Kings are going to pl probably play each other in the playoffs again. It'll be their third straight time doing that. And um, this was a very cathartic win for Oilers fans and a depressing loss for the Kings. And... You can take it two ways as a Kings fan, and both those aren't good. Well, you, you can spin it positive. One thing is, okay, well, if we play the Oilers, we're going to lose and suck, which we don't know yet, but history suggests that the Oilers will win that series. Um, the other way is say, oh, well, we lost our division playoff spot, so now we don't have to play the Oilers. Yippee! If you'd rather play, uh, I think it's the Kings. Not Kings, sorry, you are the Kings if you'd rather play Stars, who are currently in the lead. And if not, it's the Canucks. You might like to play the Canucks, I don't know. Um, I guess the last time the Kings played the Canucks as an 8th seed, the Kings went on to win the Stanley Cup. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, the Kings dropped in the standings to the second wild card. Vegas replaced them with their uh, handy win over the Jets, 4-1. to one. Um, So... As an Oilers fan, you know, we're, there's lots of discussion of who would you rather play and all that kind of stuff. And everybody kind of wants to say the Kings. Um, and maybe my opinion isn't super trustworthy because I am partial to Vegas and I, I'd like to see Vegas do good. Uh, so if the playoff, playoffs ended right now, the Oilers would play Vegas, not the Kings because of what happened tonight. Uh, but I also think of it as like, okay, well, let's say we play Vegas. If I'd rather lose to Vegas than lose to L.A. And I'd rather beat Vegas than beat L.A. So that's why I would rather play Vegas. And I, I, I also don't want to play Vegas because I like Vegas and I don't want to have to hate them. But I might have to. I don't want to. Don't make me choose. But um, the way Vegas is playing, Oilers might win. But they're still a very talented team. We all know what they can do in the playoffs. So I shouldn't say too much. That Those are my thoughts. Um... But at the end of the day, the players shouldn't think about who they want to play. They should go into the saying, we don't care who we're playing, we're going to beat them. Because that's how you have to be. That's how you're going to be uh, when you get to the Stanley Cup. Because you're probably going to be playing a really, really good team in the Stanley Cup Finals. It's very rare that a team that sucks gets there. Uh, and then if they do get there, it's because they're riding a lot of momentum and usually a really good goal. The most recent example is the Canadians. Price could have taken over and beat the Lightning... It didn't happen, but it, it could have. It wouldn't have been the first time that a goalie just utterly takes over. Um, 
Dominic Hasek also almost got close to it, even though his Buffalo team was good. Uh, it, it was Dominic. <laughs> Anyways, that's once again it for tonight. It's bedtime for me. I will see you soon, hopefully, and you'll see me sooner if you uh, have your notifications turned on and are subscribed. Uh, I would also very much appreciate it if you leak, leave a like if you think I've earned it, and please leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Uh, once, have a great rest of your day, night, or wherever you're at, and I will see you when I see you next.